sing for you. You would regret every minute of that. No, I thought you'd come proud from every. I'll let James do that. He wants you to sing. Good morning, everyone. Glad to have you here for our Chatham Area Transit, uh, February the 17th, and uh, uh, call to order and ask for the roll call. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Chairman McCackett? Here. Dr. Thomas? Here. Mr. Broker? Here. Mr. Dawson? Um, Mr. Dawson is not going to be here. He had a medical problem oh, this morning. Yeah. So I'd like to make a motion that he be excused. Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. French? Here. Mr. Holmes? Here. Mr. Mayadolf? Here. Ms. Allison? Um, make Council a motion. Medical. <coughs> okay. You make it, uh, Jim? Second. Okay. It's been made and seconded. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Ms. Collins? Present. Okay, next we have on the agenda uh, approval of minutes for the January 20th uh, meeting. Need a motion on the floor. Unless someone has a particular correction or addition they would like to add. I move for approval. Second. Second. I have a motion on the floor and a second for approval of the January 20th minutes. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Action items under item three, the heavy duty bus consortium participation approval. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <coughs> Cat staff um, through the Georgia Transit Association um, work together with the smaller um, transit systems in the state, all of the heavy bus operators in the state outside of MARTA. MARTA has their own purchasing. Um, the idea of purchasing for buses is a very detailed, complicated process. So what most smaller systems do is have a tendency to buy off a larger um, contract from the larger transit systems such as Houston, Atlanta, so on and so forth. And over CAT's history, we've consistently done that. Um, and FTA, over the past couple of audits, have found an issue with the fact that we purchased off of these consortiums um, that were outside the state, outside the region, so on and so forth. So what we looked at doing in the state of Georgia is all of the small transit systems coming together, forming our own Georgia consortium, um, to do an FTA compliant procurement <coughs> and to take effect the volume pricing. Um, so CAT participated in that along with Athens, Clark County Transit, Cobb County Transit, Augusta, um, Albany, um, as well as Gwinnett where I used to be. <coughs> and so that procurement process for that has been completed. The procurement documents um, are in compliance with FTA. And what we're requesting is formal approval from the CAT board for participation in the consortium. What this participation would mean is that over the term of this agreement, there are a certain number of buses that are set aside for Chatham Area Transit. We have the option to purchase the buses um, that are set aside for Chatham Area Transit, not purchase the buses, or we can assign them to one of the other transit systems if needed, which is in full compliance with FTA. Any questions? Uh, I, yeah. Yeah, why, would the, why would the FTA take issue with our consorting, if you will, with uh, bus systems outside the state? Um, because of certain piggybacking clauses. <coughs> so the latest one, like the piggybacking clause that we purchased off of, and so we made sure through through this process we covered not at all of our eyes and crossed our T's. And we have one set up for the state of Georgia. Okay. So it's but if it was your question, if we went out of state, it, 
would be more competitive? Not necessarily, but, but I mean, that's a good follow-up. I mean... I like the idea, but uh, is that the kind of cost? How would that pay? We got competitive costs. You had to do an independent cost analysis, mm -hmm. so the cost that we got had to be compatible with that uh, other okay. consortium. The out-of-state consortiums are complicated because it's hard for us to get the original documentation uh -huh. on all of the detailed paperwork that the FTA requires. So it's not really a pricing issue, it's more the support documentation. Okay, so that's part of FTAs. Well, yeah, and yeah. we went through the process, um, the auditors were in, and they were throwing up, and I think one of the classic <coughs> ones was after we purchased our water <coughs> contract, the question came up um, about independent costing and things of that nature. I was like, well, why do we have to do that? And the response was because the rate <coughs> said so. So what we wanted to do was do a procurement that was in compliance with all the regulations. But the price of our Georgia group will be competitive with yes. the same as the price of Houston. We won't yes. lose any purchasing power by being a Georgia group. No. This is to our advantage. But do you just question is it are the is our Georgia consortium competitive with other consortiums? I mean Yes. Okay. I mean so we wouldn't really benefit the benefit is by going out of state. The benefit is for we're gonna be limiting our ability to go out of state number one. The that leaves us with carrying out the procurement ourselves. So the problem is if we go in to buy five buses, we can't get five buses for the price of a hundred buses. Gotcha. By doing it ourselves. So the notion wasn't to go in it alone, but to build a consortium or coalition to take advantage of volume pricing. How many buses are you going to have in reserve for us? We have 25 reserves for over five years, so five years. Any other questions? Okay, and as Terry mentioned, it's very difficult to go out of state to uh, uh, to comply with uh, the regulations. <coughs> and by it doing does that. get a little bit more expensive because you have to send a team to the locations um, for inspection. Yeah. So yeah. the admin fees add to the cost also. Okay, I need a motion on the floor for. Uh, to participate in the bus consortium. So moved. Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, motion carries. Okay. Item number two, the trolley purchase. Uh, thank you. Um, so the first step was important in order to carry out the second step, which is agree to purchase two buses off the consortium. Um, we went through the process and got a special grant from FTA, and Sammy is providing the local match to replace the cutaway buses that we had in downtown Savannah and replace those with trolley replicas. So the total purchase price for this is $926, $926,630 with um, a federal grant covering $741,000 and the other local match coming from the um, Savannah Mobility Management $185,000. Any questions? I, I just have one quick one. Could you remind me who Sammy actually is and where their money comes from? Uh, their money comes from a variety of places, but Sammy is a 50C, 503C nonprofit that was set up by the Chamber um, to handle downtown <coughs> transportation services um, for tourists and tourists that come to town. Um, it's so Sam is comprised of the Chamber of Commerce. It is comprised of um, um, Visit Savannah, um, CAT, the City of Savannah, the Trade Authority, um, the large and the small hoteliers um, in downtown Savannah. And of course, uh, CAT provides the uh, administrative oversight for Sam. Um, that's through Nick Kim Holt, who is the DOT administrator. <coughs> Okay, but well, we don't provide any funds directly. No, we don't <coughs> provide any funds okay. directly. Okay. So we provide the, um, I guess we house it, the board meetings are here, we manage it, we mm -hmm. operate the service. Okay. Any other questions? 
Uh, we need a motion on the floor to, for the trolley purchase. So moved for approval. Second. I have a motion on the floor and a second for the trolley purchase. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion approved. Item three, the award of the IT support contract. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, staff is requesting <coughs> the approval of contract for IT support services to Infinity Incorporated uh, here in Savannah to provide IT support services. The procurement um, RFE evaluation um, matrix is attached for your review. Um, the contract would, as I said, provide support services, um, everything from our IT network infrastructure, um, cell phone, mobile device, so on and so forth. It's covered under the agreement. It is a um, three-year contract with two one-year options. Um, that's adjusted over term of contract for CIP um, that would not exceed um, $200,000 annually. And it is less in comparison to what we're paying now. So and this it's, and it's, local. it's local and it's less than what we are currently paying. But it standardizes our fee over a five-year period to help know and understand what the cost <coughs> is going to be. And it's also local. Any questions? I don't have a question. I just have a comment. I'm glad to know that it's, it's local. Okay. Uh, that's one of the things that we're trying to emphasize uh, across the board, uh, where we can utilize local people that we do that. I think that's wonderful. Motion on the floor for the so I have a motion on the floor and a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, <coughs> motion carries. <laughs> Item four, the award of the landscape maintenance contract. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, staff is requesting board approval for the award of landscape maintenance contract to landscape solutions. Um, we had three successful proposals that met all the technical qualifications and procurement guidelines um, the procurement evaluation sheets are attached. Landscape Solutions was the highest rated um, vendor. Um, this contract would consolidate currently four vendors that uh, provide landscape services for CAC um, under one contract. Again, it is a three-year contract with two one-year options adjusted by CIP um, with a cost not to exceed $180,000 annually. Now, uh, how does this compare uh, with the other it's, two it's, and they are, is it a saving? It is significantly less than what we have with the four vendors by combining them under one. Any questions? No. Uh, Bill? I, I was just going to ask you, so, so what would their job be with respect to the individual bus stops? They, their job would be to service each of the individual bus stops once a week, um, some high profile bus stops twice a week and some some of the major stops and locations um, five times okay. in a week. The contract also combines the landscaping for this facility, the CAD operation the main facility, as well as Hutchison Island, um, as well as minor repairs okay. um, that exist. So we have different vendors for all of those, and the notion is the combination of the one for the volume purchases and need to set a structure in place so that we have less fluctuation from one year to the next. Okay. And so with trash collection yes. be part of that? Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, but again, I like less and local, so the concept is, is good. But my question was, who monitors what they do? Um, that is um, monitored by maintenance or quality assurance supervisor. Because I've, I've been down in that section behind where the hotels are several times last year, and the grass gets pretty, the pretty nasty. Behind where the hotels are. And we're like, how uh, Hands is, all the hotels down at the end of 204. Oh, in the Quaco Road area. Park, about yeah. the, down past Quaco Road. Okay. Make just just as a comment, that I mean, I've been okay. there several times, and it gets pretty, also, pretty uh, overgrown. On that same note, the area out there in uh, on Lathrop, a couple of times, we got to complain about. Um, what right of way we have from those stops? 
going out? Um, well, the contract calls for a um, 10 foot diameter around the pole. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a five foot radius around the pole. So if you're going through certain parts of town, you usually see a circle cut okay. around the area. They're required to treat for certain things such as ants so on and so forth. A couple of times out on Augusta Avenue, we were called concerning that. Okay. We'll pass it on to our contract and find it, so. Any other so questions? Okay, we need a motion on the floor for the landscape maintenance contract. So moved. Second. I have a motion on the floor and a second for the landscape maintenance contract. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Award is approved. Now, next, uh, the award of bus cleaning contract. Chad. Um, yes, a uh, request to the board approval to award a bus cleaning contract to Hands On LLC. Um, Hands On LLC is a DBE that operates primarily throughout the East Coast and the Southeast United States um, in bus washing. Uh, we had two successful proposals. We had, in a sense, the proposals, we had more than that, but there were only two that met all the technical requirements of it. Uh, and the staff is recommending the um, Board of a contract of hands on LSC in the amount of a not to exceed 110,000 annually. And that's for our bus cleaning, um, detailing, maintenance for, for the vehicles. Now, will they use our uh, Gwinnett Street location to do the cleaning or they have another street? They will use our Gwinnett Street location. Um, and the type of cleaning they do will be different than the cleaning we have on a day in and day out basis. It will be the detail cleaning with the shampooing of the seeds and things of that nature. Any questions? I need a motion on the floor for the bus cleaning. Move for approval. Second. <coughs> okay. All in favor of the bus cleaning? Aye. Signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Award of the marketing on call consultant. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, staff is requesting an award of a uh, three contracts for on call marketing, graphics, and printing services to Quest Corporation of America, Clark Creative, BXM Marketing. Um, this is an on call professional services. Um, there is no cost associated at this point. Um, the projects will be assigned by task order as our other on call professional services are. But this process was one to simply go by and qualify who we feel were the most qualified uh, in the professional services realm to provide marketing support, um, graphics, and communication. And so there are no costs, but staff is requesting the on call professional services contract to be awarded to each of the successful proposals. proposals. Any questions? So, so this is really, I mean, we just have a contract to call upon them right. when and we so need to call upon them and we don't really have to call upon them all year if we don't. We don't. But and when we work, we'll work by task order and uh -huh. we'll follow procurement guidelines. So based upon whatever the service is we need, if we feel is the one provides, and bear in mind this is a professional service unlike a, a bus cleaning service. Right. So the criteria are different. You have to evaluate the one that will bring the best um, product to the table in this particular category, and a task order will be created, and it will be in compliance with our guidelines. So the task order, um, outside of a certain amount, will come back to the board for approval. Can, can you give me an example of what a work order might look like? Well, I, I can give you an example of our existing work orders. Okay. So we did the um, the project at Hutchinson Island. Um, it is an on-call professional services contract with um, Thomas and Hutton Engineer. So Thomas and Hutton wrote out a detailed task order. Their prices, which they put in their proposals, are set for the term of the contract, <coughs> the professional services, the hours, the times, so on and so forth. So we brought that, that back to the board for approval. Right. So the way it would work in marketing is if we are um, interested in doing um, a new publication for an annual report, 
Well, we know that Clark Creative probably is more inclined to do the printed documents or Quest, for instance, might be more inclined to do a commercial boutique. So they have different products. So they would write up the proposal, send it in, and it would have to come to the board for approval in excess of signature authorities that's in place. And it would have the whole program, and the board would have to approve the task score. But it would be an existing contract in place to do that. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? <coughs> Need a so motion on the floor? Well, well, just, so how we how do we budget for this? I mean, because it's on you can only use it when you need it. You have a you have a marketing budget mm -hmm. and you would budget against that product. So if we wanted to do a <coughs> a marketing study and marketing analysis to find out I don't know what do we want to find out, and they submit a proposal. We can get one or two proposals from them, and one comes back at 45, one comes back at 50. If we think the one is 45 is correct, we'll bring that to the board and ask the board for approval of that $45,000 task order against the pre approved marketing budget. But we still, this won't exceed, we won't let this exceed our marketing budget. Oh, man, we'll and there are some grant ramifications also. There's some materials and supplies, the schedules, information for our passengers that um, we can get grant reimbursement for. And with these contracts, we don't have to go through the quote process and, and the extensive RFP process every time. Terry, give a couple of examples of that. When we order our schedules or we have passenger information, it's usually two or three times a year. And our internal staff would have to basically do a mini procurement, get the quotes, collect the paperwork every time. And with this contract, we can use any of these vendors, and the FTA takes this procurement as compliant. Gotcha. Okay, any other questions? Okay, need a motion on the floor and a second for the marketing on call. So moved. Second. Have a motion and a second. All in favor of the marketing on call, signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, motion carries. Next under presentations, the audit transmittal. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, at this point, I will turn it over to Terry um, for the um, presentation on the audit transmittal. We don't have um, a PowerPoint presentation. Basically, the final audit draft was included in your package. Um, no changes from the information we discussed at our committee meetings. Um, we had a... Um, so there's no movie? No movie, okay. no movie. Basically... Well, it, it's one time we mix, so... <laughs> basically, this is the formal transmittal of the bound document. Um, Ken Duncan with Daniel and Duncan is here to respond to any questions that may have come from your review of the document. I don't have any questions about the audit, but I do have some questions. Um, we've, we've talked about a lot of things in our committee meeting, financial implications. Has anything changed since that meeting because there was some urgency in that meeting? We, we have a couple of things that have changed. Um, the one was going to be an executive director's report, so I'll move that up. Okay. Um, federal government um, on the 9th, I believe, mm -hmm. um, FTA finally the federal government finally announced the um, allocations of funds through FTA and came down February 9th. <coughs> and so we begin the process of um, applying for those funds and beginning to draw, draw them down. Mm -hmm. So on the 23rd, I believe, we go to the um, MPO. Mm -hmm. um, since they only allocated 8 twelfths, that 8 twelfths should be enough to get us through the um, fiscal year. So um, we will, um, after after that is um, going through the process approved by the MPO, we submit the application. Um, we should begin to draw down those funds, um, which will um, be a tremendous help in our cash flow situation. Yes, yes. And, 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 and we are we are still waiting to hear back from the county on the um, SPLOS. We've submitted the information. And so once we hear back from that, those were the two pockets of uh, money that we were looking for and expecting. Um, and both of them seem to be. Did, did, did Lee Smith give you any indication of when you hear back from Mr. Davenport? Uh, this week. This week. I just want to make sure we're 
a little better off than we were than two weeks ago. Two weeks right. ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. We weren't sleeping well two weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, that, that's really good news. Um, I know. How do we yes. dodge that bullet? I mean, what what happened in Washington that was it something you did, Dr. Reeves? No, no. Or the president? The reason I did that. The Democrats and Republicans got along. Okay. No, no, they didn't. I, it was, I guess, going through the um, through the process, and it's taken about 60 days to flow down through. Because, as you know, the budget should have been approved in September. It wasn't approved until the December, right before the December recess. Right. And so, from that point, it's taken... I guess 45 days or so, but we could have used the money six months ago. Right. Um, but right. It should have been coming down. So, so um, we're in the process. Uh, we're amending the grant, submitted a grant, and have another one going. So, I think Terry told me this is probably going to be the first time she's comfortable in since transition. Since transition. So, so, so Terry, you're sleeping at night? A little better. Yeah, little good, better. good. The um, revisions came through, and that got us through February. I anticipate that the swatch will come through for the next 30, and then by that time, we should be well on our way to getting the grant. I mean, that was troubling me when, as you know, when we sat through that committee meeting, I, was, I went straight over to the county yeah. and requested that meeting so that we can do what we need to do. And as soon as they are, um, as soon as they let me know how much we need, we can of course send a reimbursement, and, and that will be probably what comes quickly. Thank you. Okay. So we have Mr. Duncan here. If there are any any questions or comments from the one on the I I think the the two things that were significant that were pointed out um, is that it was a um, clean audit and cap was still considered a low risky. Auditor, 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 auditor. Where the auditee, so the um, auditor was able to rely on internal staff work for part of his audit work. We also um, had an unmodified opinion. Uh, net assets did decrease slightly, but um, we still have 42.7 of that, um, or 43.2 of that 42.7 represents our investment in capital. So let me ask one final question, if that's all right. Based on the news that you received recently, and when we get straight with the county, we're looking pretty good as far as things yes. overall. Yes. Yeah, we, we because still. Because I know you, work, you and the staff have worked very hard to establish some financial stability for this organization. And we were getting there, and then I yeah. left that meeting two weeks ago, and I wanted to pull my hair out. We're, so we're, we're still on track to end the year um, with our debt down to four million and on budget. With the county. Um, okay. Yes, down to four million and under budget. Um, and one of the things we'll talk about Saturday um, is going forward. We are. I don't know the technical term, but Ken and Terry are here. But we're going to budget for a reserve, but it's what, what's the technical term? Contingencies? Yes. Reserve for contingencies. Reserve for contingencies. And, and we can do it in, in two ways funded and unfunded. So if we begin to build it in an unfunded manner, then we can, of course, fund as, as the cash becomes available. Okay. But that's the game plan um, that we'll kind of talk about in the budget retreat. Um, because as you know, what we said we wanted to do over five-year period, which is now four years, is not only pay off the debt, but pay off the debt and come out with the reserve. Yeah, so. Okay, do you have anything <coughs> that you might like to add today, since y'all did a great job and showed that we were, uh, you know, a uh, job for cash? Nothing, um, other than what went through the committee meeting, uh, you know, we did issue an unmodified opinion on both the financial statement audit and on the, our audit of, of the major programs. Uh, there was one finding, which uh, everybody's aware of, I guess, now, uh, dealing with the reconciliation of, of the detail to the general ledger, which management has responded to, to that comment, and uh, really nothing else. Okay. Very good.
All right. Uh, next then is the FTA MAP 21 safety management system. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we have a um, presentation here, um, the FTA MAP 21 safety management system update, which will be done by our um, Director of Safety and Environmental Services, Erica Franklin. Um, she will be doing the, the movie, uh, the, the video. <laughs> Um, but this is a follow-up. Mr. <coughs> French was able to um, attend a um, board members conference and one of the big issues that came out of the board members conference was the whole idea of safety. Um, and what we want to talk about is a change in the FTA federal requirements associated with safety as well as some of the things that are going on here. So, Erica. We're visually challenged. Yes. Can't see. I'm here. Terry's nearsighted and farsighted, and I'm nearsighted. <laughs> <laughs> so if you hit the slideshow, I can see the arrow. Just poke the icon. Why did it close that? You hit no thanks. Exit on the top. Okay, here we go. Okay. So um, as most of you know, the FTA is working diligently to stand up the National Public Transportation Safety Program under MAP 21 Century Act. And if you don't know, this presentation will provide a, a brief overview of the safety-related initiatives that they will develop and announce in the months ahead of how they will affect our industry. Um, so basically all it is is a state o um, safety oversight program and a nationwide risk management framework. Um, so portions of this presentation were obviously taken from the FDA's latest transportation research board meeting in January 2015, um, and it'll kind of give a brief overview of the things they're going to announce in the months ahead and how it will affect our industry. Um, so basically this initiative will develop an effective regulatory safety oversight program for our industry. Um, what is it? It's about strategically applying resources to risk. Okay. Um, why? Why MAP21? Why SMS? Um, well, because we need the right tools. There's nothing standardized across the board for public transit agencies. Um, it will provide rulemakings and guidance, training and technical assistant for, assistance for people like me, um, you know, even CEOs, COs, people that are in need of standardized training if you're wondering if you're doing the right thing every day. So it will standardize that whole process. Um, obviously, it's going to require some safety-related rulemakings, but the great deal of the vital work they're doing does not require rulemaking. It will take the form of policy guidance, technical assistance, um, and training from their colleagues in the actual industry. So what will they do? Um, well, overall, they want to make a safe industry even safer. Um, Despite some preconceived notions, public transit is considered a very, very safe industry as it is right now. Um, they want to foster sound safety policies for all transit agencies across the country. Um, they want everybody to have the same uh, efficient safe practices for risk management. Um, so everybody will have essentially the same safety policy. Um, they'll know exactly what to do in every single situation. Um, they will help pinpoint nationally trending safety hazards. They'll even help provide you with assistance <coughs> in investigating accidents, so they're all investigated the same. Um, they'll help you conduct safety inspections, provide technical tools. Um, for example, last April they actually nailed down some of the coursework requirements in SMS, not necessarily for specific transit agencies, but for their people who actually go into the field and conduct audits of transit agencies, they'll all be done exactly the same. So everybody will be on the same page. All right, so obviously, you know, what they want is that standardized framework. What nobody wants is to be reactive. You know, we don't want any of those pictures that you see up there. We can only prevent accidents from reoccurring if we know how they happen and if we are proactive. All right, here's a little bit more about their, about their framework. Um, 
it boils down to this um, SMS safety management systems will provide a framework for more proactive and effective approach to assuring safety and meeting industry challenges. Uh, basically what it's going to do here, it says for itself, but it will change our approach from reactive to proactive oversight bottom line. And by doing this, it allows all transit agencies once again to be on the same page. Um, so, Let me yes, ask sir. you this. Let's go back uh, to the one before this one. Mm -hmm. One more? Uh, no, no. This one. Th this one right here, man. When uh, it says on that, uh, say on the third one, where agency specific and industry wide risk exists, mm -hmm. they um, they will transmit that to us about those particular things so yes, that uh, our staff can address that and advise our board. Right. Yes, sir. That would be another tool that would be useful. If, if I may. One of the things that transit systems do, every transit system in the country has their own set of safety policies, procedures, guidelines. Um, so what we have here is different than Columbus, different than Cobb County, different from Marta, different from Jacksonville. And so what this new approach is, is to set up one system, one protocol around the country. Well, we've seen FTA do this before in terms of when they federalized the federal drug and alcohol program. So before a transit system could have a drug and alcohol program, a testing procedure, another one could not, so on and so forth. So they made it as a requirement to receive federal funds. You have to have a drug and alcohol program. You have to test a certain percentage of your people. The tests have to be below this. You have to report the information. You have to provide follow-up, so on and so forth. So the same type of approach is going to happen in the area of safety. Um, it, it comes down to resources as much as anything else, number one, and then secondly, it's a culture. Um, if you go to a larger system where they can have a safety department with 50 people compared to a transit system that has <coughs> one person um, who's spread out over safety, training, environment, so on and so forth, you have a different dedication to the resources. So it will be a system set up similar to how they have in the airline industry and other industries with the um, Transportation Safety Board, Review Board. So they're, they're going to work on the federal level as well as on the regional level to help implement some of the safety guidelines and programs. So what will eventually come down the line is a new set of guidelines um, with safety that the board will have to um, adopt at some point. Okay. I um, and you move on to the uh, where you were. Yes. Okay. Um, so where are they at now? Um, from their latest update, um, they had another meeting back in October, I believe, and they started there with a, their goal to initiate a, a pilot program. And part of the pilot program is that they're going to partner with transit agencies that volunteer um, to kind of transition to safety management systems. Obviously, they would start conducting gap analysis and support uh, development and develop implementation plans. Um, I mean, basically, that's that's going to build upon what we already have in the industry. But like Dr. Reese says, it will definitely make everything standard across the board because there's a lot of discrepancies. And even with drug and alcohol policies now, they all have to be federally compliant, but the company can also add things to that. So it would standardize all policies. Um, um, status of the safety rule makings, this is kind of a, a timeline that they've thrown out there um, where they're actually going to start posting things in the Federal Register. You can see there they've got all, all the way from early 2015 to mid to late um, 2015 to develop their agency safety plans. So basically they're pursuing an open and transparent process um, in the years ahead and they've planned and have promised to keep us informed through communications such as webinars and trainings. That's it. Any questions? Any questions, Jane? So, is this a real positive development? I mean, it is. Yes, with very this? much so. For the industry, it's a very positive um, development. As you know, we signed up um, last year. Um, Mr. Broker questioned my wisdom on 
why we put ourselves out like that. But um, the notion is that we're certainly going to be on the cutting edge of safety, and we'll be a guinea pig as part of the process. But hopefully we'll improve the safety, not just here in Savannah, but all over the country and the industry. And since this SMS, uh, one of the things that uh, we'll be adding that, so uh, y'all have already put in a plan for safety and try to reduce the accidents and those that we have had, and uh, it has re uh, gone down, but this will uh, be even better once it's implemented. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Next. Uh, the executive director's report. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, executive director's report, um, fixed route ridership is um, up 8% on the month. Um, we did have an increase. Um, passenger travel remained steady. On-time performance remained steady. Um, complaints were the same. Uh, we did have an increase in um, preventable accidents. January 2014, we had one. January 2015, we had two preventable accidents. Um, and I could probably give you um, um, more information on those accidents um, separate from here if you'd like I can update you. Um, on the paratransit, um, ridership um, was up 20% for paratransit. Um, over 7,300 trips for paratransit from last year to this year. Um, or the, the monthly total was 7,300. So <coughs> service is up 20%. Um, On-time performance is up 6%. Um, excuse me. Productivity is up 6%. On-time performance is up slightly, and complaints are down. Overall, we're up across all modes, and overall ridership is up 5%. Uh, we have Mike Viker here who needs, who's going to give us a legislative update of what's going on in um let me ask you a quick yes, question first, if that's all right, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chairman. The, um, in the paratransit, the ridership still going up. Weren't we going to do some screening? We're doing that now. Okay. Is that helping at all? Well, it, it's the initial phase, so we just started the process of screening it. The, as, as we talked about during the, the whole paratransit process, we're not certain it's going to reduce the, the demand we want to be careful of is we can slow the growth up because as the population well, continues. Well, I mean, it's up 20% and we can't keep <coughs> the trajectory, it's going to sink us. Yeah, absolutely. So I was just wondering if any of this had been implemented. It, it has been implemented and I think we are, we actually took the board members out <coughs> for a tour last month right. um, to go through the process so we just started sitting um, Send some of our customers through the process. You probably haven't even recertified anyone yet, have you? Or? No, no, we're in the initial certification. Right, that's so right. So it's early on. I mean, in other words, I just don't want people abusing it. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Now, what are the comments when uh, the people that are being interviewed to see if we can take them from paratransit and put them in the regular system um, and it will, you know, uh, favor us, but favor them too, because uh, I think that at some point uh, they'll be able to uh, increase uh, their areas that they want to go to. Yeah, I mean, that's one option. The, the other option is fixed route ridership is $1.80 and door-to-door, -door excuse me, fixed route is $1.50 and door-to-door -door is $1.80, so 30 cents or more to come to your house. So that's something that we probably should look at. Of course, that'll be on the table for discussions mm -hmm. um, at the Board of Treaty Center. Do we have to set it at a fee? I mean, to me, do you, you it can, should be more than that. If it it, it can be up to twice. Yeah, I'll check the rates. It was either twice or two and a half. Yeah. It's up to twice, but we and set I it for. I think 30 cents is not much to encourage people that can get to the curb and I mean, if somebody wants to come pick me up at my door, I'd pay the extra 30 cents. <laughs> 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 and, um, <coughs> and 
any additional you know comments that they are giving our people when we are interviewing them to try to move them over? No, sir, not yet. As I said, we just started the process, doing the initial interviews and then doing the screening. So um, I guess we're less than a month into it, to the process of doing it. Okay, and then we got to look at these people that do have disabilities and all about not to um, uh, cause uh, any kind of interruption with them on the paratransit because that's uh, really important. That's one of the reasons why we do have paratransit. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I do think it's, it's really important to stress that, that at the end of this process, I think we will have satisfied ourselves that we are indeed providing services to the people that need for that whom need the it. service is designed. Right. And we're not necessarily interested in taking people off the service, but we want to reassure sure. ourselves yes. that the consumers who participate are indeed eligible to participate. Yes, you're absolutely correct. That's as long as you can stay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mike? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we are in the middle of the uh, legislative session. You might ask why I'm here instead of there. Well, I felt that, uh, number one, there really was nothing that was going on today that was uh, directly related to our interests, and I thought it was very important uh, to address the board directly about just where we are on legislation. Uh, as you saw last week, uh, Senator Lester Jackson introduced two pieces of legislation at the request of the county. Uh, one be, being Senate Bill 106, which would restructure the board, uh, moving from nine to 11 members. Uh, the other piece of legislation being companion Senate Bill 107, which would set forth a requirement that there be a feasibility study conducted and delivered to the county before there was a move to extend services into any additional area. Uh, we have opposed both of those pieces of legislation because truly they are, number one, not necessary, and number two, they are out of sync with the process that we are moving forward with at this point in time. Two point, Senate Bill 107 requires that there be a feasibility study to look at uh, providing substantial uh, support for the extension of services. We are already in the process of doing that study and I'm in communication with the mayors on the west side and we'll be having some public meetings with the citizens on the west side to look at what would be necessary to move forward and what would be advisable uh, in terms of if and when uh, we would look at extending service to that area. So the legislation that would require that would require something that's already underway. Uh, number two, the legislation that would require that makes that a condition of further extending a special service tax district. The authority of extending that special service tax district is reserved for counties in the Constitution. So you cannot put requirements on the exercise of that constitutional authority that is held by all counties in the state. Secondly, moving to the board restructuring, we feel very strongly that this board works and has worked very, very well and there really is not a logical reason to expand the board. The one reason to expand the board could be to add additional representation for west side jurisdictions that are not having service now but would have service in the future. Senate Bill 106 does not do that. It does not recognize that at all, nor does it make, make possible in its structure the automatic addition of those individuals representing, let's say, Bloomingdale, Pula, Fort Worth, Worth, et cetera, on the board. So as I said, that legislation is premature. We will continue to uh, oppose that as we move forward <coughs> through the legislative session. Uh, it does not have support at this point in time uh, in the Senate. It does not have support at this time uh, in the House nor did it, does it have support of any of the west side jurisdictions at all. So I think we're in good position uh, in terms of holding the line on that. Yes? What was his reasoning then for those two bills? Can't tell you. I mean, I'm just curious. 
Well, let me just say this. We've got a good board here. We can see what the uh, executive director and, of course, uh, his staff people and what this board has done on uh, bringing up things like you brought up things, uh, Helen, good ideas and, uh, you know, and multitudes, you know, uh, we can listen and see what all of us are, you know, dedicated and loyal for transportation to as many citizens in this county as can be. And adding just two people, uh, you know, you can see uh, if there's something that can be done. But what happens is, on one piece of that legislation, it, uh, uh, you know, it dissolves this board. Dissolves this board altogether. And new people are going to be awesome uh, on the board now to be, you know, appointed on it. But we uh, have gone even beyond just being a board because we have added an advisory committee of the people uh, for the transit system, uh, which was looked at. And uh, in fact, we've got the chairman of that uh, in the back room there uh, who uh, was voted by his people on that and has come up with uh, uh, some things that he's going to bring to the board. Then also, the other part of it is they said, you know, we need more business people on the board. Well, we've got a, uh, a committee of business people uh, that are on that particular board and will be assisting us and working on specific things now. In fact, one of the members on that is the president of the Downtown Business Association, Rule Joyner, uh, uh, as uh, one of the members on that. So we have gone beyond just being a board by adding the transit, uh, situation plus the business uh, situation also so that we can have inputs from them and it won't be just adding you know one or two business people it's going beyond that Helen one last question Mike I, I know this is a moving target but w where do we stand and what implications currently on HB 170 for transit. Uh, well, uh, that was going to be the next item that I was going to get into. H HB 170 is the game in town. It is mm -hmm. the transportation bill uh, that would provide up to a billion, perhaps more than a billion dollars of new dollars <coughs> directly to the Department of Transportation. The way it does that is it takes the existing sales tax that we all pay on gas gasoline at the pump, that 1%, that 2%, 3%, whatever that is, and converts that to an excise tax, a motor fuel excise tax. Currently, we all pay 7.5 cents in motor fuel excise tax per gallon. That's not charged based on a dollar, but it's per gallon. That tax would move to 29.2 cents per gallon on gasoline and 33 cents per gallon on diesel fuel. The importance of that is by the state constitution, motor fuel excise taxes are restricted for use on roads and bridges. Now that's, that's the good news that that money will be restricted to that category. And there's an attempt in the bill to define transportation purposes as roads, bridges, and a whole litany of other things, but there are a number of us who think they're running <laughs> up against constitutional brick wall because it's very precise roads and bridges, motor fuel excise taxes. That's, that's kind of the good news and the bad news because transit's not in there. Uh, other things are not in there and they're trying to bring those in, but what they're doing <clears throat> is they've recognized that they're now, yes, there is a role for transit to play. Transit is very important uh, to the economy of the state, uh, particularly to Metro Atlanta, but with the systems that we have throughout the state. And we don't have just five transit systems, as, as Chad well knows. We've got 14 <coughs> major systems, two really large urban systems, that being MARTA and CAT and then 114 rural systems that range from <coughs> one bus to maybe five buses out there. 
you cannot use again the motor fuel excise tax for transit. So what the state is talking about, what the House is talking about doing is eliminating, number one, the $5,000 tax credit on electric motor vehicles that is on the books now and charging a $200 annual fee for alternate fueled vehicles and $300 for commercial alternate fueled vehicles that will provide a pot of money. We're not sure exactly how big that pot of money is. We think it should be around $100 billion that could be used for transit. Now, here's, here's the problem in the puzzle. You can dedicate that motor fuel tax because the Constitution says it has to be dedicated. You can't dedicate that hundred million dollars. <clears throat> so we're eventually, and this is going to be a, a moving target that will emerge as we go through the process. And two things have to happen. Number one is, obviously the legislation has got to be passed that is going to determine what the dollars are that are going to be available, not only in motor fuel tax, but in that pot of unrestricted funds. From that, then there is going to have to be a significant effort on the appropriation side <coughs> through the Economic Development <coughs> Committee that does the, the transportation budget for the House to determine just how those monies are going to be allocated. Now, there has been discussion of setting aside, of doing a bond issue for that $100 million for transit, but that would be a one-year infusion of capital into the system. There seems to be a little bit of resistance to that, but again, this is a work in progress. There are some formulas floating around. MARTA has already proposed that perhaps the rurals ought to get 15% of this money and the other transit systems would, would gain a formula based on the size of the system which winds up with Marty getting between $39 million and $70 million of the $100 billion pot of money. Well, I'm not sure that that's going to be uh, real popular. We're working on that. Our focus, quite honestly, is to determine what we can do to make sure that there's going to be money in, in this bill and in that budget for transit and that we get our fair share of that money. Uh, there are a couple of other things that are, that, that are knocking around that are a little troublesome. Every three years, we have historically gone in and extended language that provides an exemption for transit, particularly, it also involves school buses, but transit in particular, for that motor fuel excise tax. So we don't pay that 7.5 cents tax on motor fuel that we purchase right now. But that tax, that tax is gonna go to 33 cents per gallon and there appears to be some pretty strong reluctance to extend uh, that exemption. It expires July 1, 2015. We need to get it extended at least to 2018, and there are a number of us up there who are making the argument, look, we have had this historically, it is going to cost our system money, it is gonna cost all the systems money, it's gonna cost the school, cost the school systems money, and this is not, future revenue that they're going to forego. This is real dollars that we're going to have to spend out of our pocket. And I think it accounts for about $128,000, $129,000 to our budget alone. On our fuel budget. Out of the fuel budget. So we're asking that this be eliminated altogether. So permanently. So we don't have to go back in and do that. So there are, are a number of issues that are swirling around. <coughs> uh, the, the legislation is moving forward. It's not moving as rapidly as we once thought it was. Uh, there's some muttering that they may not have the support at this moment for that legislation to pass out of the House, but I, I can assure you this is a priority of the, of the House leadership and uh, they, they will get the votes to do that. Once it crosses over into the Senate, the Senate is talking a number of different things right now. Uh, one thing that we're hearing out of the Senate is perhaps some discussion about taking the rental car excise tax that we've been talking about for a couple of years. That's what our board approved last year. Yes, and we've not, we're, we've not done anything on that because what we're hearing from the Senate is they are considering taking that rental car excise tax and <coughs> jacking that up by a number of percent and using that as one of the key funding sources for the transportation bill that would be for transit 
and not for not just for transit, but for transportation overall. Here again, those would be unrestricted dollars that would not have to because it's not motor fuel excise tax. It's just a rail car excise tax. They're also floating the idea of a one cent statewide sales tax, which would raise about 1.2 billion. The defined need for all categories is about 1.5 billion a year for the foreseeable future to get us to where we need to be. So there's a lot of work going on. There's a lot of work to be done on this. And stay tuned because what you see today will change tomorrow. And this is one of the most complicated issues uh, to get your hands around, I think, that I have ever, ever had to work on because you have a combination of a tax that is levied on a gallon and a tax that is levied on a percentage on a dollar and how they come together, where they come together, and how we bring this budget issue together uh, as we move forward. And then particularly on the transit side, how we corral all of the transit agencies together, 128 of them, uh, to see if we can reach some kind of agreement to have a unified front moving forward to go to these legislators and say, if you are going to provide this pot of $100 million, this is how we, the universe that would be the beneficiaries of this money, see this equitably being shared. And so that's where we are. If I could uh, have Nick talk about, as he talked about, <coughs> they introduced a formula for the distribution of the funds for transit systems out of Atlanta with MARTA and ARC. And Nick <coughs> has uh, drafted our counter proposal. Very good. To talk about what we have suggested here at, at CAT and um, distribution fund. Yeah, sure. So uh, working with uh, what MARTA had proposed and what other states uh, use as formula distributions for transit allocations, uh, we came up with a counter proposal that I think has a more equitable representation of CAT, MARTA, and the other large transit systems, uh, while also increasing the share that the rural systems get, and that's partly political that sense to, you know, gain buy-in from the, uh, the legislature that's uh, based in the more rural parts of the state. So uh, so we've got a counter proposal that's in Mike's hands right now uh, that we're working with that would lead to um, a larger allocation for CAP than what Marta was proposing. And, and one of the things what's so good is that we're the second largest transit center, transit uh, area in the state of Georgia. So a formula, we just look for a, a fair formula that would be uh, for the distribution of that particular money. MARTA, of course, being the, large, the largest one, and then uh, CAT being that way. And as was stated, you know, you've got a number of other areas uh, around the state, and they only have, you know, just a very few buses in on their particular line. So anyway, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate uh, what all you're doing. Hey, can I just ask a quick sure. question? So uh, you know, one of the things I think is it's really good to hear that there appears to be consensus at the state level that all of these transit systems need help. <coughs> um, I know that you know that years ago, and I've been on this board long enough to recall that you know when we would do capital projects. It was always 80 from the feds, 10 locally, and 10 from the state. But the state just walked away from this several years ago. And they really have not done anything to help us out with the transit scenario here. So I'm really glad to hear that there's consensus that transit of this sort needs to be supported. I know that, that MARTA and systems north of Atlanta have gotten support from the legislature, but we have really not benefited at all from that. So we've really been left hanging, and it's been a real disservice, I think, to the people in our area that we serve, you know, at the state level. The, the other thing I'm concerned about, however, is it's my understanding that the cities and the counties are really gonna, gonna take a hit, you know, if, if any of this stuff or much of what you're talking about goes forward, and it sounds to me like it's just a shell game well, in, in many respects. What, what happens is the cities and the counties uh, are going to take a hit. School boards are going to take a hit as well, and there's a separate issue there. Uh, <coughs> what will happen? What the, what eventually is going to happen is there will no longer be sales tax charged for fuel. That those will roll off on a 
uh, a varying basis depending upon the tax, but generally when a voter authorized local option sales tax expires, then that sales tax will no longer continue to be collected on gasoline. Initially, they were going to allow counties to levy a 3% excise tax and cities to levy a 3% excise tax. They've actually backed away from that and now have come forward with the fact, with a recommendation that the counties would have the authority to levy up to a 6% excise tax. And it would roll on one, two, or three cents at a time <coughs> as uh, local option sales taxes expired. So it wouldn't happen all at one time. That money would be collected at the, at the dealer. That money would go to the state, then the DOT would send that back down to counties and cities based on the Elmig formula, which basically is the old local assistance road program where it's based on center, road, center lane road miles and a number of other things. And in a tip of the hat to the rurals, the rurals have insisted that those center, of the center lane road miles include dirt roads as well, All which right. apparently they did not. So uh, that's what's happening there. The counties like it, the cities do not. The cities uh -huh. are swirling around trying to figure out how to effectively combat this, and they've not been able to gain any traction whatsoever. The school systems, on the other hand, lose that 1% on motor fuel on East Floss when that expires. There's no way that they can collect a motor fuel excise tax because they are restricted from spending any money on roads and bridges. So that is money that is going to be lost unless the legislation and the legislators decide that they're going to allow uh, school systems to continue to collect that money and we're not have no real idea that that's going to happen at all so that's kind of the posture that we're in there are there are a lot of pockets of folks that are supporting this a lot of pockets of folks that are opposed to it a number of pockets of folks that don't like certain things but can't figure out how actually to approach them or find themselves in a catch-22 situation which is basically what the boards of education are facing right but, but and this is my last comment. But Mike, don't we don't we have a situation where state legislators are just trolling for taxes that have already been levied, and they're going after them, and then they're passing it down to the cities and the counties mm -hmm. to have to raise taxes themselves, so that they can walk away at the end of the day and say, I did not raise your taxes. Well said. Exactly right. That's exactly right. And oh. and. Uh, whether the other things are, all of us, you know, we have said this, and uh, we've got a lot of people in our county, as many <coughs> other cities and counties around this state, because if you look at, again, uh, for people to know, and most of us know this, is that in 2000, we had 16,000 people without transportation in Chatham County, 16,000. And they didn't have a friend, a neighbor, uh, a loved one, you know, to take them back and forth, whether it had to go for a job, uh, for medical assistance, uh, go buy food and other uh, necessities and all. And then in the 2010, it showed that we had 22,000 people in Chatham County that didn't have transportation. Going beyond that, uh, in the two, uh, 2013, they added 2,000 more. So in Chatham County right now, we got 24,000 people that do not have transportation. And thankfully, uh, you know, we're going to continue to do whatever we can so that we can provide that necessity for the people that don't have transportation and keep lobbying for it and do whatever we can because we are, uh, you know, letting people down when we don't have a transportation system that can help them and not give negatives to them. Thank you. If, if I may, Mr. Chairman, um, next week um, <coughs> the Georgia Transit Association will be at the Capitol. Um, Cat's actually taking one of our buses up to the Capitol next week, and we're following our Capitol meeting with a um, visit uh, board meeting of the Georgia Transit Association, um, and we'll also. The AFLCI will be there next week as well. We'll also have their support 
in our um, legislation. So, Mr. Chairman, you were there at the Savannah Day yes. uh, at the Capitol, as so were others. And um, <coughs> one of the things that those of us who were there um, expressed very vividly uh, the need for the support and our legislators, even the governor, uh, expressed a desire uh, to help move forward. And, um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, as I told them, I don't want to keep hearing a lot of lip services. I, I, I want to see some action because year after year, year after year, you go through the same process. So uh, my thing is that we continue to, to work and hopefully that they will, you know, see the light of day that the needs that we have here uh, in Chatham County, that um, they will give us some help from the state level. Okay. Uh, my report, Mr. Chair. Okay. Uh, right now, we need to go into executive session. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. 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 Wait a minute. Oh, okay. Unit updates. Uh, information on the safety and training update. The safety and training update is in your packet, um, <coughs> and I'll, up, I'll uh, address any questions you may have. What was the uh, the issue with the pedestrian that was hit by the bus? Um, yeah, it was a trip and fall, and that's something I can highlight to you on. I'll give you some particulars about that. Later. Okay. Any other questions? Safety <coughs> and training. Next, service and delivery update. The service and delivery report is in your packet, and I'll entertain any questions you might have. All right, then, system development update. Again, the system development report is in your packet, um, and I will entertain any questions you may have on that. Financial update. Yes, the financial update is in your packet, um, and I'll entertain any questions you may have. One thing to note is that we did make a uh, million dollar payment um, toward our line of credit reducing, excuse me, toward our loan reducing that to four billion. And outside of that, I'll entertain any questions. I'd, I'd just like to make a comment on that, and that's something that this board has worked really hard, and your financial people have worked really hard to make make a reality and I think everyone deserves yeah. a pat on the back for accomplishing that because that is a very concrete step toward you know the financial stability of our organization. That's so right. Yeah let's not just pass that over. That's yeah, that's, that's big news. And we want everybody to know this and especially the people that might be seeing this on television on channel sixteen that we also have the other committees where we have once a year, I mean once uh, a month now, where the, it's the financial, uh, the service and delivery, and the development, uh, you know, uh, in that. And that's really important because uh, the ones on those com particular committees, uh, and it's helping out uh, when we get comments and the training uh, on these particular ones and the information that is distributed to us and that are on these committees, it makes a big difference. And we can see that <coughs> this board here is uh, committed uh, to continue to do the good things and participating, not only just a, a board meeting once a month, but to have uh, these other particular committees that way need to address. And uh, I'd like to thank all the board members for participating and helpfully in uh, making a big difference, uh, you know, to uh, move us into a more positive area. Okay. Old business. Anyone with old business? New business. Anyone, anything new from our board members? New business. Yeah. Uh, new business. 
Okay. All right, then. Um, uh, next is the executive session now in the proper area, and we need to go into executive session for purposes of real property transactions. And so we need a motion on the floor uh, to approve the executive session. So moved. Thank you. have a motion on the floor and a second to go into executive session uh, for the purpose of real property transactions. Anyone else that is just visiting or uh, what have you, uh, please excuse yourself. Oh, look here. Wait a minute. I didn't even see the deputy chief here. That's the number all right, two. sir. I got to run to another meeting, so I'll come back the next time y'all come back in session. That's fine. I didn't know because I'd have brought you up when we got this uh, uh, business situation. That's no but, problem. But let me ask you all. Would you all want to listen to uh, the chief because she came here specifically to give some information on we can wait on. Does she need to go? Yeah, she has time. I mean, if she has yeah, time. But if she's got another meeting. Right. Uh, I do have to be to another meeting with the county manager in a few minutes. So oh, okay then. Not a problem. I'll, I'll come back. You know, okay, well, thank you very much. Right. Uh, and thank you for the I, good I job that you're doing because as being 